Hey everybody, welcome to the second episode of Brittany Unfiltered. Uh, as you can tell, I am not in my normal studio setup. A um, little bit different. I'm actually out of town this week, still working, um, but out of town, so I'm filming from a different location. So it's not my normal setup, and so a little bit different. But um, I definitely didn't want to miss a podcast episode particularly because it's only the second episode and we're trying to get this thing off the ground and make sure that we always have content for you guys, Um, but also because there's been so much fun stuff to talk about this week so far. Um, Not normally the case on Tuesdays. Sometimes the news cycle is just up up and rolling, but there's actually been some interesting things that I really wanted to discuss with you guys, so I didn't want to miss an opportunity uh, to talk with y'all. A couple of housekeeping things real quick. Uh, This is something, again, we started this last week. This is a completely independent project of mine called Brittany Unfiltered. It's something that we're going to do every Tuesday. Going to try to have episodes up by about 9 o'clock on Facebook and YouTube. Um, Obviously, sometimes uh, being pregnant and sometimes being out of town like I am today, um, sometimes life kind of precludes that, but that's the goal so far. Also understanding that your evenings are very important to you and that you're also very busy. Um, We are going, we're working on it. We haven't gotten there yet, but we're working on making sure that we can pull the audio and uh, upload this in podcast form, actual podcast form on places like uh, iTunes and Spotify and places like that so that if you do happen to miss an episode on Tuesdays when it airs live, you guys will be able to download it and listen to it on your way to work or school or dropping the kids off or something that works a little better for you. Um, So bear with me. I will absolutely let you know when we get that off the ground, but that is a goal and there will be other ways to listen to this coming very shortly. But for now, Very glad that you guys are with me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hopefully everybody's kind of, um, kind of, uh, piling on here and, and, and starting to join into the live video. So hi, if you're back, um, and if you're brand new, then thank you so much for joining us. Um, there, there was a couple of really interesting things that I think have developed this week that I really wanted to touch on. And the first one, which is kind of, you know, The elephant in the room, the donkey in the room, I guess it's the donkey in the room because we're talking about a Democrat here, Uh, but Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And I say that with the caveat that I understand exactly what many of you think the minute I mention that name because I feel it too. I feel like we've gotten to this point where the minute somebody says Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or AOC, as she's become known because her name is so freaking long and hard to say, um... There's like an immediate turnoff. There's an immediate, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear her name anymore. I don't want to talk. Would you guys just please stop talking about this girl? And I get that because honestly, I'm tired of it too. I'm tired of it too. It feels like she kind of just burst into this spotlight and she's gotten all this attention and all of these interviews. And really, at the end of the day, she's a freshman congresswoman, which basically means she doesn't have a whole lot of power other than the power that others give to her. So there's this sense of, we should just stop talking about her. And I, I get that. It's, it's, it's kind of a weariness that comes along with this. I understand that. And frankly, I'm tired of talking about her. I'm tired of writing about her. At the same time, I think it's really important, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why I'm going to continue to talk about her, uh, hopefully not ad nauseum, hopefully not to the point where it gets obnoxious, but I'm going to continue to talk about her, I'm going to continue to write about her, and I'm going to continue to expose the dumb things she says and the dumb policies that she puts out. The reason is this. I don't see her simply as a new celebrity that has come up in the Democratic ranks. I don't just see her as this 29-year-old who's enjoying this newfound fame. I think that's part of it, and I think where that, that's where some of the annoyance comes in. But I also see her as a perfect, probably one of the best we've gotten so far, snapshots into the Democratic platform, into the, the agenda that they've wanted for a long time, but haven't quite been as bold in pushing as things like the Green New Deal, which sort of just, you know, threw it all out there and exposed exactly what the left ultimately wants, which is a government takeover of just about everything. And I think that I think that Ocasio-Cortez perfectly encapsulates where many of us have seen the left going 
for a long time. And what we've been screaming about and why we've been talking about why it's so important to push back on socialism, because ultimately this is what they want. It sounds absolutely crazy, but this is what they want. They want to take over the energy sector. They want to take over agriculture. They want to take over education and healthcare. They've actually made strides in a lot of these, in a lot of these areas. That's what they want. She happens to be one of the few who's willing to come out and admit it in such an open and exposed way. So the reason that I'm going to continue to bring her up and the reason I'm going to continue to dismantle all of the dumb ideas that come out of her mouth four times a day is because I, I think you have to. I think this is part of pushing back on socialism. When she says dumb things, I don't like to write about it and I don't like to talk about it just to know, oh, ha, ha. You know, Ocasio-Cortez said something dumb today. Well, you know, must be a day that ends in Y. It's not that obvious. It's not, it's not to mock. It's not to just jeer on a personal level. That's not what this is about. This is about poking holes in socialism, in these radical notions that frankly are so easy to put. You, you almost don't even have to try. But it's exposing socialism for exactly what it is. It makes no sense. When she goes on with Anderson Cooper and he asks her, um, how are you going to pay for all of this stuff that you talk about? And she says, well, I don't understand why we have to keep talking about what, how we're going to pay for it. Why do we keep asking that question? That's socialism. That's socialism, right there in a nutshell. It sounds like a stupid statement, and everybody on the right likes to make fun of it, but it, it, that's exactly what this is. Socialism is about taking over things and not knowing how you're going to pay for it, and that's how people end up eating animals in the street, like in Venezuela, or having to bring their own scalpels to hospitals if they're patients. They have to bring scalpels for their own surgeries, as we've seen in Venezuela. That's what socialism is. So I think it's important to talk about her, not to, to glamorize her, not to glorify her, not to give her more credit than she is due, but to dismantle the ideas that she brings to the table, because those are the ideas that the left is going to continue to push. I mean, we've seen it now. We've got multiple 2020 presidential contenders who are all on board with this Green New Deal. This is what they want. This is not just some 29-year-old girl from the Bronx slash upper class New York or wherever the heck she's from, because I still can't get a bead on exactly where she grew up, whether it was the ghetto or, you know, millionaire row. But this is, this is something that the left has been pushing for a long time. This is something that Democratic presidential contenders are actually pushing for. So I think it's important to talk about. Long-winded way of saying AOC is not going away. Her ideas aren't going away. I'm not going to stop talking about her, but I, I do think we should be select in how we do it. That that much I will give to people. I understand the weariness of, of talking about this young woman. At the same time, this is why we talk about her, because she really is truly the gift that keeps on giving. She came out with a couple of things just over the last few days that I think just spotlight the extreme hypocrisy of the left and why all of this nonsense. They, they, they seem to have decided that they can seize the moral high ground on so many of these issues and paint the right as, well, they're just a bunch of, you know, corrupt old white men and they're so out of touch and, you know, they're, they're, they, they're, they've got dirty money and dirty politics and you can't trust them. Interesting story. Interesting story. So it turns out that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her chief of staff who helped run her campaign, his name is, and I'm going to read it here because I can't memorize it to save my life, Saikot Chakrabarti. And don't ask me to say that twice because I'm not even sure I said it right the first time. Uh, we're going to call him Sai because it's just way easier for me. So Sai, her chief of staff, has actually had an FEC complaint filed against them for allegedly funneling money from campaign do donations through PACs to his own private companies. And nobody knows what they use this money for. Now, this is the allegation. This is the allegation, okay? This is what's in the, the FEC complaint that has been filed uh, by the National Legal and Policy Center, which is a government watchdog, because I'm not one of those crazy people that immediately assume somebody did something wrong just because an allegation got made. That's the other side, all right? So I'm not going to do that. But let's go with the allegation here. Let's talk about what has been alleged in this FEC complaint that they are now asking the Federal Election Commission to investigate. The allegation here is that this, this guy, Cy, the chief of staff, 
founded two different PACs, Brand New Congress and Justice Democrats, two PACs, political action committees. He then, while, while hundreds of thousands of dollars were rolling into these PACs in order to support progressive candidates, money was then funneled from these PACs to Brand New Campaign LLC and Brand New Congress LLC, two LLCs that were also started by this guy, by AOC's chief of staff. So he started these two PACs. Right afterwards, he started these two LLCs, and money started making their way from the, from the PAC to the LLC, and they were written off in the form of consulting. So that was what was on the FEC, the, the, the federal election filing reports, was, oh, well, you know, this PAC paid this company hundreds of thousands of dollars for consulting, and that's all it said. And it ended up adding up to just at about a million dollars. So this isn't chump change. This is about a million dollars going from these PACs to these LLCs. The problem here is that you're not supposed to be able to do that, right? Because a PAC has to report how they are spending campaign donations. That's why they're getting these donations. That's how they solicited the donations. And they actually have to put how much money they spent on different campaign operations, how much money we spent on emails, how many dollars we spent on flyers, you know, what did we spend on, you know, flights or whatever, so that the government and the public, in the interest of transparency, can be sure that the money that they're giving to donations, giving to or giving to campaigns, is going to campaign work. Once that money gets filed to an LLC, the LLC is not required to disclose these things the same way. They don't have to say, well, we spent X amount of dollars on this, X amount of dollars on this. So the allegation here is not necessarily that this guy was taking money in order to just fund his own private whatever. He was actually putting money into these LLCs in order to use it for campaign operations that didn't have to be disclosed. So we don't actually know what they did with the money. It could have been for the campaign, but it could have been for stuff that they're not supposed to use it for, or maybe they're not supposed to use as much of it for. Um, you know, not everything that you do, obviously, in a campaign is entirely on the up and up. If you put as a pack, well, we spent $100,000, you know, sending somebody to kneecap our opponent, obviously that that's not going to fly. But if you funnel it through an LLC, you can kind of do things with it and get away with it without having to disclose what you did with it. So that's the allegation. This is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is obviously whenever somebody does something that they shouldn't do, that's, that's bad, right? They need to be held accountable for it. So there's the obvious. The second thing is, isn't it really interesting how this is all happening? And if you've, if you've heard this story so far, I guarantee you did not see it on a national news headline. I guarantee you saw it on a conservative website somewhere, or you saw it on Fox News, or you heard about it somewhere else. You did not see this headlining CNN. But what you will see headlining CNN is if Trump does something, or did something, or there's an allegation that he did something back in his campaign where they misused campaign funding. That will make headlines all over the place. That will make the nightly news. That they will talk about for hours and hours and hours. So I find it very interesting that here you have a freshman congresswoman who has made it a corner of her platform to get dirty money out of politics, you know, to be openly transparent with the people. She's a woman of the people, right? She's down on your level. She was a bartender and she knows your life and she understands and she gets the problems that you've dealt with and she's going to she's going to come in and help make it all better and she's going to throw open the books and everybody's going to know that she's entirely on the up and up, right? That's the model that has been presented to us. Except here we have an FEC violation suggesting that she and her chief of staff, and by extension the campaign, w may have been doing some pretty shady stuff. We're not sure what they did with the money, but the fact that the money even went to an LLC and they can't explain why is pretty shady. So the fact that this allegation is made, the fact that this complaint has been filed with the FEC should be big news. Because if it's true that what they did was illegal, this is someone, I, I mean, that, that, that raises the level of hypocrisy here to just into the stratosphere. This is a woman who this is the very thing she she actively speaks out against, 
right? At the same time, you've got over here on this end, you've got Trump who, now granted, I'm not going to try to defend Trump on this because again, I don't know what he did, what he didn't do. We've still got reports that are waiting to come out. That's, I'm not trying to get into that at the particular moment. But whenever it is suggested that Donald Trump or Don Jr. or anybody else in his campaign may have misused campaign funds for something they weren't supposed to, whether it's paying off a porn star or whatever else, that is something that, I mean, the left, the left just clutches their pearls over it. Oh my gosh, how could he have done such a thing? Well, you have a congresswoman who now may have been doing some shady stuff over here. And I guarantee you that she will not be treated the same. I guarantee you that that will not be treated the same in the national news media, by the left, by Democrats, by leftists on social media. That won't even be a drop in the bucket because we have such a double standard now, not for whether or not somebody does something wrong, but who they are what side of the political fence they fall on, and whether or not we're going to condemn them for it. So hopefully you've heard that story. If you haven't, now you have. You can go look it up um, in, in more detail. But again, the, the level of hypocrisy we see here, even just based in the, the coverage of these stories, I think is extremely telling. Um, kind of as a side note, it's a little interesting too when, when talking about hypocrisy and the way that uh, this young lady, Ocasio Cortez, tends tends to see different subjects. It's kind of a it's a it's a do as I say, not as I do sort of mentality. It's kind of like, well, it's you know, I I really want to do away with all of your cars, but I'm gonna fly around on my airplanes. That's totally fine. You know, we saw that a lot with the whole climate change conferences. Nobody should be driving cars. Nobody should be flying airplanes. Nobody should be using fossil fuels. But that's how we're all gonna get to our conferences is on private jets. So we see that kind of hypocrisy a lot. Um, this week, of course, AOC came out very strongly. If you don't follow her on Twitter, first of all, if you're not on Twitter, don't get on Twitter. Save yourselves. It's too late for the rest of us. If you if you are on Twitter, you really should follow her because it's it's really kind of a gaffe machine and it can be a little funny at times. She came out today against Uber, who she claimed, and I'll read it here, Uber has taken in $12 billion in investment and has had revenues of $1.7 billion in 2016. Yet their drivers only take home $3.37 an hour. Does that sound right to you? That was her tweet. First of all, if you're an Uber driver that only takes home $3.37 an hour, I'm not really sure why you're an Uber driver at this point. I know a lot of Uber drivers who take home $20, $30 an hour. If you're taking home 3 bucks an hour, you're probably doing something wrong, and you might should rethink either your job or how you do your job. Uh, it's kind of like why if you are a 32-year-old burger flipper making $8 an hour, the question is not why you're making $8 an hour, it's why you're a 32-year-old burger flipper. That's the bigger question here. Um, but of course, she wants everybody to be paid umpteen gazillion amounts of dollars simply for drawing oxygen, so she thinks that's a problem. Interestingly, interestingly, since declaring her candidacy in 2017, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has, get this, her campaign listed 1,049 transactions for Uber, Lyft, Juno, and other car services at more than $29,000 total. They spent almost 30 grand on car services. The campaign had 505 Uber transactions alone. So she's perfectly fine using Uber. She is perfectly fine spending her money on Uber, but she's going to lecture all the rest of us and the company on why they're batty, bad, bad. So again, what's good for the goose is not good for the gander here. Uh, I think that's pretty obvious. I, I think it's a great reason why you should be wary anytime a politician, and this kind of goes for both sides, not saying there aren't some good, honest ones out there, but they're few and far between. Anytime a politician comes to you and says, we're going to be totally transparent. We're going to be totally transparent. We're in this for you. We're in this to serve you. We're, we're nothing shady here at all. The fact that so many people are willing to buy into that line for somebody like AOC is ridiculous. No, she's not. 
No, she's not. She's not any more than any of the rest of them are. She's going to keep using her airplanes. She's going to keep using Uber. You know, and, and we're going to see what, what turns out with this Federal Election Commission thing. I think it's going to be very interesting to see if they actually did something illegal, because if they did, that makes her no better than the people that she likes to rant against who are all dirty and shady. And I think that that really kind of undermines a big part of her platform. So anyway, that's my spiel on AOC. I'm going to shut up about her now. We're going to take a quick break. Be right back here with you in just a couple of minutes. Um, hang in there for me, and I'll see you in a few. Hey guys, welcome back to the second episode of Brittany Unfiltered, brand new podcast project I started just last week. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of this particular episode, um, I am actually out of town. That's why I don't have my typical setup that you see in the background. Um, so I'm just kind of hanging out elsewhere and we'll be back in my normal setup next week, but definitely didn't want to miss an episode with you guys. I uh, love spending time with y'all um, and wanted to talk about some of the bigger stories this week and actually some of the ones that you may not have heard because I know that... Uh, uh, a lot of times, and, and this is something that really played into why I wanted to start a new podcast, why I wanted to start a longer form project, um, because I've noticed that as somebody who lives near Washington, D.C. and kind of operates in this media bubble, I think one of the biggest problems that the media in general tend to have, even those of us who consider ourselves more media watchdogs who try to bring you alternate angles to things, who try to tell you news that maybe you didn't know. I think one of the things that we tend to get wrapped up in is these huge stories that seem really important to us because, you know, when you're in the news cycle, there are certain things that you think are super important uh, that actually really aren't that important to the American people. I think there's a there's a really strong tendency to lose touch with what actual Americans care about, what impacts their lives, um, things that, that matter to them. And so that's one thing that I really want to concentrate on in this podcast. And as we progress forward, again, it's only episode two. Um, but as we move forward, I really want your feedback on things that matter to you, stories you would like to hear more about. I know a lot of you in, in past videos that I've done have mentioned that you really like positive news stories. So that's something that I definitely want to bring to the table more. Um, but things that matter to you. Things that you want to talk about, things that you would like answers to. Um, I don't promise that I can answer all of them, but we'll definitely talk about things that impact your daily life more. And in that vein, there's something that really rattled me as an upcoming mom for the first time. Um, got a little a little peanut growing in there, not not so much a peanut anymore. As a matter of fact, he he kicked the lid off of a Pringles can that was laying on my stomach today. That was the first time. I think he's ever kicked that hard, um, you know, but he he already isn't even here yet. And he's changing my perspective on the world and how I see things and really just this intense desire to make the world a better place for him and to protect him from a lot of the things that I'm seeing now. Um, you know, not to be paranoid. And, and, and we've we've always had struggles. It's a, it's a fallen and sinful world, right? So we've always had struggles. I remember back when I was a kid, uh, when my parents were going through, I'm, I'm the oldest of three, and pushing us through school and, and trying to make right decisions and having never done it before and not knowing what they were doing. And, um, you know, and they did the best that they could. I'm sure that you do too if you have kids. Uh, and so will I do the absolute best that I can. But I think that, Maybe any, every generation thinks this, but there is a sense of, you know, there's a lot of really bad stuff in the world. There's a lot of, 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 of things that um, I think have changed so much just in the last few years, just with the advent of social media, things that people didn't face before, things that kids didn't face before. And it can be really scary for a new mom, for new parents. Um, so if that's something that you're going through or if that's something that you've been through, um, just know that, you know, first of all, pray for one another. Um, because I think that that's incredibly important that we pray for one another, that we support one another. Um, but I definitely think that staying on top of news like that is very important so that you can stay educated and know what's going on. And I think that's why this next story kind of freaked me out so much. Now, I don't want to say maybe maybe freaked me out isn't the right word. Shocked me a little bit. And I don't even know why, because it, it's really not a new thing. 
But it's something that, as a new parent, is very alarming to me, and it's probably alarming to many of you. And that is that I came across this story in the Washington Post, and it wasn't just a story, it was a glowing review by the Washington Post. Just wrote this this wonderful story about how great this was, and it's a school in Arlington, Virginia. It's a public school, so your taxpayer dollars go to fund it. Um, and there is a teacher who teaches kindergarten there. His name is, and I think I'm pronouncing this correctly, his name is Jaim Foster. If not, it's Jame, and I'm thinking it's Jaim Foster, who teaches kindergarten. He is an openly gay man, which again, whatever, but you know, the, the story made sure to point that out because that was apparently a very relevant point, not only to the Washington Post, but to this to this teacher who complained that back when he was a teacher in Nebraska, shout out to Nebraska, um, he was very upset that he was constantly being told, look, you can't talk to your students about your boyfriends. OK, that's that's not acceptable. That's not a good thing. Which was red flag number one to me. Because I'm sorry, what? kindergarten teacher talks to their students about their boyfriends. You can be straight as an arrow and you probably shouldn't be talking to five-year-olds about your love life. Am I, am I the only one that thinks that that sounds a little inappropriate? There are just, there are certain subjects that re you're a kindergarten teacher, aren't you? You're supposed to be, you know, they're supposed to be coloring and you're supposed to be teaching them, you know, how to spell short words and add columns of small numbers, very, I mean, why? Why would you be talking to a kindergartner about your boyfriend or your girlfriend for that matter or whoever you're with? So I'm, but, but that was pointed out in the story as, okay, he was a teacher in Nebraska, openly gay, upset that he couldn't talk to his students about his sexuality, about the fact that he dated men, about what men he was dating. Uh, so he ends up at this school in Arlington, Virginia, um, and in um, it's it's Ashlawn Elementary School. In case you happen to have a kid there, I doubt you do, but Ashlawn Elementary School in Arlington, Virginia, now teaches kindergarten there. And for Read Across America Day last Thursday, which is a national campaign, um, he decided to bring in a transgender activist named, and I'll, let me get this right because I want to, it's Sarah McBride, Sarah McBride. So born a guy, now identifies as a girl, brings in this transgender activist to read a children's picture book written by that transgender Jazz Jennings. It's the little boy that identifies as a girl and is has, has a TV show, I Am Jazz, and is this you know, TV personality, um, and it's kind of become the figurehead of transgender children and why that's totally okay and we should be totally okay with it. So Jazz Jennings writes a children's book. This transgender activist comes in to read to five-year-olds from this book about how it's totally okay if you're a little boy who thinks he's a little girl or vice versa. And then Sarah McBride proceeds to share his own experience about how he did not feel like a little boy. He felt like a girl. And I use their, their original pronouns, by the way. I do that on purpose because I don't like switching pronouns just because. Like, you're not going to tell me that I have to do that just because you say so. If you were born a he, you are a he. If you were born a she, you're born a she. You can't change your chromosomes. So I'm going to continue to use the pronoun that you were born with because like it or not, that's what you are. And I'm not going to change that just because, you know, Twitter has decided that I have to. Uh, that's not the way that this works. It's not the way that I roll and it's never going to be. Um, so this Sarah McBride decides to tell all of these kindergarten, and by the way, the pictures from this thing, you can go on the Washington Post and look it up. The pictures of this thing, they've got, they've got posters about how awesome transgenderism is. They've got posters of um, Jazz Jennings, and, and I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a display. It's a display for five-year-old children about transgenderism and how that's totally, totally cool. Uh, and then in the process of telling this story, Foster, who's the teacher of this kindergarten class, tells the Washington Post that this is something he's been doing for a while. He makes sure to stock his little children's library in the corner of the classroom with books on uh, children who grow up with gay parents or uh, children who identify as different genders. And it's all under this guise 
of teaching children inclusion and teaching them respect for other people because they like to put this sheen on it. Have you noticed this sheen on it where they make it or they try to make it so that you can't argue? Well, we're just we're just teaching little children to be compassionate. We're just teaching little children to be respectful of people that are different than them. Look, I have no idea or I, I, have, I have no problem teaching children to be compassionate. Let's let's get that straight right now. I don't care who you come across in life. I don't care if they are as mentally confused as you can possibly be and they think that they are a ficus tree. You should never treat someone with open disdain and disrespect. But that's a general thing. And they use this guise of let's teach respect to push the idea that this is normal. You can be respectful to someone. You can understand that they are a human being who is created in the image of God and deserves dignity without agreeing with what they're doing. And the left is liked to conflate those two. You cannot respect me unless you agree with me and affirm what I'm doing. If you don't, you don't respect me. So they've kind of clouded this and they're using it as an excuse to now indoctrinate children, other people's children, no less, under this guise of we're teaching them respect. So I've got a problem with this, obviously, on several levels. The first is, can we, can we state the other? Can we, can we not all agree that kindergarten is a little too early to be teaching them anything about this? I don't care what side of the fence you fall on. Kindergarten is too early to be talking about sexuality. It's too early to be talking about gender identity. It's too, look, these are, these are children who literally just learned how to pee on their own not too long ago. Okay, they're, they're extremely unfamiliar with their own internal plumbing, much less how it compares to the person sitting next to them. The, whatever happened to the age of innocence where we just let five-year-olds be five-year-olds? No, now we've got to get them when they're young. We've got to indoctrinate them when they're tiny, especially when they're away from their parents who might not agree with us. We're going to put them in a public school classroom and we're going to teach them what we want to teach them. That's the left's new mantra. And do you remember back, it seems like yesterday, but just a few short years ago, when the, the push on the left was gay marriage, that was the thing that they wanted. It was like, you know, just give us that and we'll shut up. And there was this there was this push for stay out of my bedroom. This is what I do. You don't need to be involved in it. So just stay out of my bedroom. It's my life. Leave me alone. You shouldn't care. And everybody said, well, all right, then go do and be whatever you look. I don't want to know what goes on in your bedroom. I don't want to know whether you're gay, straight. I, I don't care. I don't want to know. So fine. That was the argument that was made. What's, what goes on in your bedroom stays in your bedroom. Nobody else has the right to dictate that. How quickly that morphed from leave me alone, it's none of your business, to, well, now I'm going to indoctrinate your children. Now I'm going to teach other people's kids that everything that I'm doing is perfectly okay, regardless of what their parents teach them at home regardless of what they think. I'm going to push my ideas on your kids and it's going to be state sanctioned and there's nothing that you can do about it. If I recall correctly, I seem to predict some of, or I seem to remember some of us predicting that. I seem to recall some of us saying that that is exactly what was going to happen. It was never going to be enough that just will leave me alone to do what I want to do. No. This whole acceptance thing is now where it's at. It's not just accept that I live in society alongside you. No, now it's accept what I do, accept that it's normal, believe that it's normal, and oh, by the way, I'm going to tell your kids if you don't. Five-year-olds. Five-year-olds. I wouldn't want a kindergarten teacher teaching my five-year-old about sexuality and gender and orientation and all of that stuff, regardless of whether or not they believed what I believed. First of all, some things are not appropriate for five-year-olds. Second of all, some things should be left to the parent. All right, if you believe that transgenderism is totally okay, if you believe that it goes against every norm known to God and man, whatever you believe, that should be left up to the parent. I know that we have confused in this society the line between a parent and a teacher, and that it's gotten all mixed up, and that teachers are now having to take on the roles of parents because parents are abdicating that, that responsibility. 
But these are things that should be taught by the parent. And I wonder how many parents of the children that sat in that class on Thursday and listened to a transgender activist talk all about how it was perfectly normal if you don't feel the way that you were born and confuse a bunch of little kids. I wonder how many of their parents knew it was happening and would be okay with it happening. Because I doubt very seriously that a flyer was sent home beforehand letting anybody know. I really, really do. And as somebody who is an expectant mother, and as somebody who is going to have to make decisions about where to put my kids in school over the next few years, uh, it'll be here in the blink of an eye. And I'm telling you, this is one of the things that alarms me the most. The idea that anybody would be so bold as to presume they can teach my child about these things without me knowing, without my consent, and regardless of what I believe, and regardless of how I bring them up at home. Um, so again, this is this is something that I think should alarm everybody, even if, even if you disagree on this subject, which I doubt you do. Look, I'm, most liberals that I know aren't even down with this whole trans, transgender thing. They're most liberals that I know don't even don't even accept this as the norm. Um, but even if you do, can we not all at least agree that indoctrinating somebody else's five-year-old according to your own personal point of view, probably not a good idea. And definitely, definitely not something that our taxpayer dollars should be going towards. That doesn't seem like such an outlandish statement to me. Maybe I'm crazy though. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's kind of the more niche story that I wanted to talk about today. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, and hopefully this has been an enjoyable podcast for you. I hope it hasn't gone, I hope it hasn't gone too long. I was trying to keep it closer to 20 minutes. I think it's actually coming in at a little over 30. So sorry if I kept you guys too long. Um, but anyway, next Tuesday, I'll be back in my own little studio space. Uh, things will look a little bit better, maybe a little bit more professional. And again, like I said earlier, working on making sure that we get the audio for this so that we can put it on iTunes and Google Play and Spotify and places like that so that y'all can download it and maybe listen to it um, on a time that is a little bit more convenient for y'all. So again, thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. Make sure to leave your feedback. Send me messages. Let me know what you guys want to talk about. Really interested to know what you guys want to talk about because as we as we get further along here, I definitely want to start tailoring our conversation to things that actually matter to you um, and to make this worth your while. So thank you again. I appreciate it. I will see you guys back here next Tuesday.